Two weeks ago, I posted a poll on my community page asking what you all wanted to see as an audience on my channel. And this is something I like to do every couple of months to see how the audience's interests have changed and what you want me to focus on on my channel. The engagement on that post was absolutely phenomenal at over 1100 respondents and the general interest really mostly revolved around a dividend stock analysis as well as the analysis of small cap growth stocks. Now, I definitely know that I've been releasing a lot more growth style content recently and then sort of incorporating some dividend stock content through the analysis of Rio Can's Q2 earnings as well as the top eight REITs in Canada comparison video that I did last week because by nature REITs do have high dividend yields. High dividend yields on real estate investment trusts are great and all but most investors do also like to diversify outside of REITs specifically for dividend yielding positions. So that's exactly what we're going to be speaking about in today's video. We're going to be diving into the quick analysis and overview of two dividend stocks that have nice yields and that you should be adding to your watch list. Hey what's What's going on savers and investors i hope you're all having a great day as always if you're new to this channel then welcome my name's griffin and on this channel we speak all things investing from specific company analysis industry analysis stock market news real estate and more so if any of those topics interest you make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell button so that you're notified whenever i release new content today's video is going to feature two financial dividend stocks that trade on the toronto stock exchange that i personally identified as being great dividend positions that are trading at a discount and that have nice room for growth over the coming years. By the way, if you're still looking to open your very own brokerage account to start trading as stocks, ETFs, and other financial securities, then make sure to check out one of the links down in the description where you can open either a Quest Trade or a Well Simple Trade account and get some free money for doing so. Also, if you enjoyed the video at any point in time and it's providing you value, then please take two seconds to drop a like on this video. It really helps the channel grow. All right, so the first talk we're gonna be speaking about in today's video is Genworth Mortgage Insurance Canada, ticker MIC on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And this happens to be a stock that I spoke about on the channel a long time ago. However, I wanted to revisit it in today's video based on the current state of the real estate market in Canada that's going absolutely haywire right now. Genworth happens to be the largest private residential mortgage insurer in Canada, providing a mortgage default insurance to Canadian residential mortgage lenders. I've actually spoken about this process of mortgage default insurance before on the channel in videos where I was speaking about my real estate transactions, but essentially when an individual is looking to purchase a home with less than 20% down payment of the value of the home, they are required to get what's known as mortgage default insurance, which Genworth is an issuer of. The company works in partnership with lenders, mortgage brokers, real estate agents, and builders pretty much to make home ownership a possibility for Canadians that don't have that 20% down payment on their dream home. And during their years of business, Genworth has been able to provide 1.5 million Canadian families with this possibility of putting a less than 20% down payment on their home. I've even used their services myself when I purchased my last rental property at a low down payment in order to maximize a return on invested capital. But anyways, that's a topic for another video. The reason why I chose Genworth for this undervalued dividend stock video is primarily due to their current price point in relation to what's currently going on in the overall Canadian real estate market, as well as the fact that they have a relatively low price to earnings ratio, nice dividend yield, and a low dividend payout ratio. First, starting off with the stock quote, this stock trades at $36.28 per share over the weekend here as I film this video and markets are closed, but this was down 0.38% over the trading day and resulting in a market cap of $3.128 billion, making this a medium cap company. Their trailing 12 months price to earnings ratio is 7.74, so actually relatively low and standard for the industry with a forward price to earning slightly higher at 8.19. Earnings per share are also decent at 4.69 over the past 12 months and their price to book ratio is very cheap at 0.86, meaning you're getting in on their assets at a very low relative price point. Finally, their price to sales ratio is also quite low at 3.38. The reason why their dividend yield is quite high right now at 5.93% is due to the fact that the stock itself is still down roughly 40% since the price point in February and has since had a difficult is recovering as with basically every stock in the financial industry right now from insurance companies to banks. This very nice dividend yield is also following a 12-year dividend growth streak and even at this higher yield right now,
know, we're only looking at a 46.25% dividend payout ratio. So for anyone looking to capture some nice dividends moving forward, this could be a great option. But why is the stock still down significantly by roughly 40%? Let's take a look at their financials first in order to see what's going on. And then after that, I'm going to be commenting on where I think this stock stands as of right now. Starting with the income statement ending June 30th, 2020, we're seeing a significant increase in premiums written since same quarter last year, and the same thing applies to the six months ended period. This is primarily due to the low interest rates in the market right now, resulting in increasing home prices and purchasing activity. We're also seeing a nice increase in premiums earned, which is the premium collected by an insurance company on a policy that has already expired. So it's basically money the insured party has paid to the insurer, being in this case Genworth, for the period of time that they were insured. Now, unsurprisingly, their losses on claims has increased by almost double for this period, and in this case, what this refers to is the amount that Genworth has paid out to the mortgage lenders, mostly banks, with homeowners defaulting on their mortgage payments because remember, this is a company that insures high debt to equity mortgages. Even at that though, everything else in the income statement is relatively straightforward and the net income has decreased only as a result of the losses on claims. With that said, the company should continue seeing an increase in new written policies for at least the coming year to two years with such low interest rates right now and a high demand for homes, resulting in increased revenue figures for Genworth. There is definitely a slightly higher risk that losses on claims will remain a bit higher for the coming quarters if individuals do continue defaulting on their mortgages at a higher rate. However, as we're going to see in the following dividend stock that we're looking at in this video, most banks are actually putting less money towards provisions for credit losses, meaning that I personally think the losses on claims for Genworth will either remain stagnant or even decrease over the coming quarters. I also believe that the increase in new business for Genworth will surpass defaults and this will have a longer lasting impact on the company's financials. Moving on to the balance sheet, Genworth actually has most of their assets as current assets at around $6.6 .6 billion and we can see here that they have been increasing their cash position, which I like to see due to the fact that they did have slightly higher claims on losses. In terms of liabilities, things look relatively high at around $3.3 billion in liabilities, but actually, if you look at it a bit further, $2.1 billion are unearned premiums reserves, which is the insurance premium amount that corresponds to the time period remaining on an insurance policy. The reason why these appear as a liability on the balance sheet is because they would have to be paid back upon cancellation of the policy. However, this value will never be paid back in full unless an absolute disaster happens and every single client stops paying their mortgage. In addition to this, they have accounted for around 168 million in loss reserves. So in terms of current liabilities, we're looking at around 447.77 million by adding together these rows. This would put Genworth's current rate ratio at around 14, which is extremely high. So what are my final thoughts on Genworth Mortgage Insurance? First of all, the stock price is trading at a very nice discount if you compare the price to earnings, price to sales, and price to book ratio with these same figures for this company over the past couple of years. In addition to this, the company has been raising their dividend by roughly 7% on average annually for a 12-year dividend growth streak. And due to the currently discounted price point, this is translated over into a nearly 6% dividend yield at a low dividend payout ratio, so this is a dividend that shouldn't be going anywhere but up in the coming years. In terms of the actual industry that this company is operating in, the Canadian real estate market has seen explosive growth over the past year or so and is still currently on fire. With housing prices reaching new all-time highs each week, this is good news for a company like Genworth because it means affording a home becomes more difficult and out of reach, with more people settling for a down payment below 20%. For example, the average price of a house here in Ottawa is now $492,700 as of 2020, meaning a 20% down payment is just under $100,000, which many new homeowners simply can't afford. 
And finally, since mortgage default insurance premiums are based off of the value of the mortgage loan, increasing home prices means more money for January. Now, reaching the pre-crash highs of roughly $60 a share might take some time to build back up. However, in the meantime, a 6% dividend yield is great for any portfolio. The second financial dividend stock that I want to bring back up for today's video is also one that I've spoken about on the channel in the past. So this isn't going to be a huge surprise for anyone who's been around for a while, but this stock is TD Canada Trust. TD is one of the big five banks in Canada that I'm personally holding long term. And even though their dividend yield isn't necessarily as high as some of the other competitors, it is, in my opinion, one of the best positions for continued long term growth. Now, the bank just released their Q3 earnings last week, and actually, all the large Canadian banks have done so. So, if you'd like to see an updated video where I compared all the big banks in Canada side by side, make sure to drop a like on this video and leave a comment down below letting me know that you'd like to see this. TD Bank isn't really a company that I feel the need to brief you on because what they do is pretty straightforward and I've spoken about this bank before on the channel so we're going to be diving right into the stock quote and then the financials. The stock trades under the ticker symbol TD on the Toronto Stock Exchange and as of close on Friday it was trading at $65.78 per share which is down nearly 1%. With that said, a trailing 12 months price to earnings of 11.53 and forward price to earnings of 11.52 so basically the exact same thing is projected for the coming year. Earnings per share were looking at 5.70 and then a nice dividend yield of 4.76%, which has actually slowly been creeping up as the stock is recovering a bit from March lows. TD also has a dividend growth streak of now 10 years, which is nice to see as a long-term dividend investor, and their dividend payout ratio is 65%, which might seem high. However, considering that last quarter, it was above 100%, we're definitely making some progress here. As of right now, the stock price is still down roughly 13.5% from pre-crash peaks in February and I chose this bank stock for today's video because in my opinion TD remains one of the best positioned banks in Canada to make it out of this difficult period that certainly isn't over yet in a better position than the others because their income exposure to interest income isn't as high as some of the others. Again once I release the video comparing all of the big banks in Canada these figures will be put side by side but for now TD remains a great buy and hold dividend stock for years to come. All right, so let's now dive into the Q3 financials of TD Bank to see how they've been faring during this period. First things first, the revenue figure for Q3 2020 totally caught me off guard at 10.665 billion, which happens to be up 2% since the same quarter last year and even higher than Q2 2020, which I definitely was not expecting. In fact, this is the best quarter ever in terms of revenues for TD Bank, which is quite impressive considering the current market environment that we've experienced in 2020. The next line here shows us that TD has attributed an extra $2.188 billion for provisions for credit losses, acronym PCL, and this is basically just money that the company has put aside to account for possible defaulted loans. We can see that this PCL figure has actually even decreased since Q2 2020, meaning two things. First of all, TD may be interpreting the current environment as being less at risk of massive defaulting, and they also must believe that the economy is slowing slowly getting better because they aren't focusing as much on loan default provisions. This is definitely a good sign as an investor overall. And actually, as a side note, this slide in their earnings presentation demonstrates very clearly how the deferred loans are decreasing across all business segments of TD since Q2. The gray bar is Q2 and then the green bar is Q3. So across the board, loan deferrals have dropped by roughly 2%. Back on the quarterly highlights, net income has decreased since same quarter 2019, but has increased since Q2 2020. And this is primarily due to the provisions for credit losses that are deducted from the total revenues before posting net income. In fact, if TD hadn't allocated an extra 1.5 billion in PCL above what they allocated last year, their net income would have been $3.86 billion. The point I'm trying to make here is that TD is actually thriving even though most investors were anticipating severely impacted revenues and financial figures. 
And finally, for the quarterly highlights, we're seeing that for the Canadian retail side of things, the quarterly total revenues are down 2% since the same quarter last year, while their loan volumes, meaning the amount of new loans they are giving out, is up 3%. This might seem kind of odd because, well, why would they be making less money when their loans are up? But it is simply due to the fact that the current interest rates in Canada are very low right now and banks make a large portion of their income from loans. Regardless, it's good to see the bank giving out more loans and decreasing the amount of deferred loans. Let's now quickly take a look at the balance sheet figures of TD Bank. First of all, we're seeing that TD is significantly increasing their cash position, which is now $166.929 billion because all of these figures are in millions, so you need to add six zeros to the end of everything. Now, if you're wondering whether or not TD will be able to maintain their dividend, other than the fact that everything we just covered is looking very very promising for the bank, while well, the dividends that have been paid out in the trailing 12 months were only $5.4 billion, representing about 3.3% of their cash position of $166 billion, so I definitely think that they're going to be fine on this front. Total assets are also increasing very nicely at now just under $1.7 trillion and that's just insane but it is a very nice growth trend since last year. Now you might also be wondering why the liabilities look so high for TD at $1.6 trillion but what you need to understand when assessing bank stocks is that it's actually okay for liabilities to increase if they mostly represent deposits which in this case they are because this means that the bank can actually go out and let leverage this money to give out more loans, invest, and essentially make more money. So while deposits are technically liabilities for banks because they have to pay out interest to customers, this isn't a huge deal because they can then leverage this money often up to five times over. This also happens to be the reason why current and total ratios don't really apply for bank stocks. Overall, this balance sheet is nice for a Canadian bank stock and it's continuously growing, which I like to see. With everything we just covered, what are my final thoughts on TD Bank? as it stands currently after the Q3 numbers. First of all, I think pretty much all investors were relatively surprised by the stellar performance of TD Bank during this quarter, pretty much on all fronts. Even though banks' revenues is highly tied to the fluctuations of interest rates, which banks don't have complete control on, well, TD Bank has proved to be extremely resilient and is outwriting more loans, which means more growth. Even at that, they have managed to post their best quarter ever in terms of revenues, and their net income was only lagging behind due to increased provisions for credit losses. In addition to TD Bank lowering their provisions for credit losses, another positive that I'm seeing here is that they are lowering their number of necessary deferrals on loans. All of this combined tells me as an investor that TD Bank has a positive outlook both for their own operations as well as pretty much the overall economy because if they didn't think that they were in a good position to do so, they would not be giving more loose if things were as bad as in Q2. All in all, I'm personally a long-term holder of TD Bank as I believe it's one one of the best Canadian bank stocks to hold in a dividend portfolio with a dividend distribution that's very nice and isn't going anywhere anytime soon. The stock price is still currently trading at a major discount even though we just saw here that in Q2 and Q3 the numbers were not nearly as bad as people were anticipating so I personally see this as pretty much a guaranteed long-term growth. Alright so that pretty well wraps up today's video. I really hope that you enjoyed this update of both Genworth Mortgage Insurance and TD Bank. If the video provided you value then please Please take two seconds to drop a like on the video it really helps my channel out and if you want to learn more about stock market investing make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell button so that you're notified whenever i release new content also feel free to let me know your thoughts on both of these companies down below in the comments so on that note thanks a lot for watching today's video and i'll see you in the next one